Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Siri Scanlon of Montfort Advisory and David Malpass of the World Bank Group. Good afternoon, everyone. I am thrilled to have this opportunity to speak with President David Malpass. Never would I have believed when I was a first year analyst in banking, eating my sad salad at lunch, that I'd be here interviewing the president of the World Bank. Um, I suppose the phrase is survive in advance, so here I am. <laughs> um, along the lines of sort of thinking back on one's career trajectory, um, I found yours to be incredibly fascinating as you've held you know, very significant positions in both the private sector and the public sector. So I'd love to hear a bit about how those experiences and your passion for development work affected your decision to take on this post and your, your uh, focus and your role today. Yeah, thanks, Siri, and hi, hi everybody. Um, I guess I, I kind of always wanted to be in international development. So even in, in grade school and high, high school, I, that, I, that, that I was into that. And then uh, I got my MBA and that, that, that was fine, except that wasn't fulfilling. So then I ended up in Washington uh, doing international things. I was the international economist and trade analyst for the Senate Budget Committee. So then just uh, uh, everything kind of fit together. At Prior that to that, we had Georgetown in common. Next That's right. So I, I came first to D.C. as a mid-career fellow at the uh, School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, uh, and that so that was good. And uh, gave so so Madeleine Albright was one of my uh, professors, uh, and uh, uh, so so um, the, the and then as as. Uh, you know, the world changed. Each each uh, step was interesting and uh, and uh, I think fulfilling, but also challenging. You know, we've seen the world go through lots of uh, progress, but also setbacks. Absolutely. Um, and I just wanted to give the audience sort of the benefit of understanding the massive scope of services that the World Bank takes on. It really is startling as you touch sort of everything from education to to healthcare to climate change. So when you think about uh, all of the sort of mandates that fall under your scope, I'd love to hear, I guess, one or two that are of particular you know, interest and sort of that you were passionate about advancing and what you think is important going forward if we look at sort of the next decade. Uh, good. Well, I, I think development comes uh, strongly from individual countries and each one is different. So in some countries it's really a crying need for a better education system and others health system and so on around. And for, for all of them, for all of developing countries, uh, I think better structural and regulatory policies that enable people to get an education, girls to be part of the education system and women to be uh, uh, founding businesses. And so all of that fits together. So what we're trying to do at the, at the World Bank is have good outcomes for the people of the country in terms of living standards. So that means less poverty, alleviating poverty, but also getting median incomes to go up. That's really important for all the other things going on, for nutrition, for health care, for education, and so on. At some point, there has to be enough progress in order to incentivize and um, move things along. Um, and that's been, I mean, frankly, that's hard to do. The development, I think, is in crisis right now uh, with, without a direction of how to get that done for a lot of the countries. Yeah, and I think in an earlier panel, it was touched on the sort of un foreseen follow-on effects of the pandemic, one being that a lot of sort of uh, order of course uh, activities were, were put to the side, including people focusing on their own health care um, and, and sort of taking a preventative approach from a circumstance becoming worse. And now we might be in the situation where we face really adverse, you know, follow-on effects as a result of losing three years. Do you have any... 
Any thoughts on that? We've worried about that, and we call it reversals in development. And so, for example, as people focused on vaccinations for COVID, that sometimes meant they didn't get childhood vaccinations right. for for other uh, uh, diseases. Uh, and so there's a catch-up phase going on. Education is a big one. We, we uh, just this afternoon, the uh, World Bank and uh, UN organizations, uh, UNICEF and UNESCO sponsored a conference uh, on, uh, on how to bring education forward. We, we, we're trying to build foundational school skills for children and they've lost ground yes. during COVID. So this is a big challenge to not only make up the, or, uh, uh, make up the lost ground and then actually move ahead. Absolutely. And I think the loss of engagement created sort of, um, you know, has furthered, of course, we can all agree, furthered our isolation as a, you know, from a humanitarian standpoint and reduced people's ability to sort of see the commonality between, you know, differing regions and, um, so I'm sure that's been. There's a split and, you know, it's accentuated or, uh, or made very clear, highlighted the problem of inequality. That's inequality of how vaccines uh, were used, but also now inequality of the energy access and uh, of, uh, of food. Uh, and I think these are, these are big staggering problems for the world to face. Uh, one other one that I'll mention that's a bit more pure finance is the debt burdens went up. And right now there is no real process for the world to, uh, to uh, deal with or to help countries that have unsustainable debt burdens. You know, in the private sector, you can declare bankruptcy and there's a process uh, that, that, that that launches, but there's no equivalent on the sovereign side. Uh, and so the, the, it's very hard, uh, very hard for, to, to, uh, f for countries to, and the people of the countries to have light at the end of the tunnel, meaning when will we be done paying this heavy debt burden and high interest rates that are going with it? And so I think that's also uh, one of the challenges right now. Well, so in <clears throat> turning to um, speaking of inflation, we obviously last week saw um, you know, surprisingly high inflation data that surprised certainly the developed markets. Um, and the World Bank just recently put out a piece calling for a projected recession through 2023. Do you have some comments on that? Uh, just to say, you know, the slowdown has been sharp. It's been one of the sh sharpest uh, really in 80 years. Um, and that's quarter by quarter as you, uh, and so it continued into the second quarter and it was added to by China's sharp slowdown in the second quarter because of the uh, COVID lockdowns. And so as we, as we then, project or look into the third and fourth quarters and into 2023, the trends look like they're continuing. That's because inflation has proved to be persistent and, and we can w worry about the energy price inflation feeding into other parts of the economy. Uh, and also the supply chains aren't coming back together. So that gives you the worry and the risk uh, and the projection of, of a world recession. Um, then important in that is, okay, how long will it last? And so my additional worry is that it looks like the slowdown may persist. Uh, that's because there's not enough investment right now going on to really pull things forward and get productivity back up. Do you feel, are there any um, sort of negative effects that are specific just to developing countries as a result of this dynamic that you'd wanna highlight? Uh, well, the higher interest rates puts particular pressure on them uh, because you, you know how the yield curves are operating. So the lower credit uh, gets hit harder. And that's true of many of these uh, um, aspects of the slowdown. The people in the bottom half are hit harder. Uh, they don't get the subsidies that governments are getting out. Uh, they're often in the informal economy uh, or their school is closed. You know, we still have a lot of children that, uh, that where the, the school schools are closed, and so they're still sliding backward. Uh, so I guess I'd highlight all of that. And then we've got to add in very, very real, the energy crisis, and there was, there was a lack of electricity for as many as 800 million people even prior to COVID, that's getting strained now because the sources of energy are, are being diverted toward uh, Europe. So it's, it's vital, as, as we say, what are the key variables? Vital to move forward on the energy side 
that's what feeds into fertilizer, uh, which then feeds into crop yields. So that's one of the persistent uh, problems that we can look at, the, the, the uh, difficulty of getting enough crops in the ground with fertilizer over the next year to feed everybody. So, and how, so to follow on from that, as you know, we're all, um, or it's top of mind to think about reducing dependence on China and Russia when it comes to um, economic reliability or, or, or in the energy space. How do you reconcile what you just described with both China and Russia hosting this bilateral meeting alongside their attendance with the G20? Clearly, world dynamics have changed a lot, and you know, different parts are struggling to have it change in their direction. Uh, and so, I, I'm not sure I reconcile that. The G20 has had challenges of of what's what, what's the purpose and the direction, and how does that all come together? One example of that is in the debt, uh, the Common Framework for for debt, which has been stalled. We're trying to break it free up for, with Zambia, so there's a chance of having a country actually achieve debt, debt uh, uh, relief, uh, I, you know, it, it's, it's still a struggle. So as, as you think about Russia and China, they're part of the world. Uh, they're, you know, Russia invaded Ukraine. And that's unresolved of how, where is that gonna, going to go. Uh, Ch China has, is, is going through a, a political changeover that's important to them and important in what their role in the world is going to be. Um, so I, I'm, I would just observe that some part of this and what I'm more focused on is underlying it is the economics and the finance of how do you get a lot of the world growing at the same time and which are the forces who can help with that, with that process. One thing I've noted, you know, is the importance of the U.S. as the biggest economy, then it's most important they, 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 for them in percentage terms, it's the easiest one to produce. If what the world needs is lots of stuff, lots of energy, uh, uh, for example, the, the U.S. Is, is a good source, uh, and that would help with this um, electricity access problem. You know, the, the, having base load for the grids mm -hmm. uh, in around the world, in all, all the cities that are running the, the, uh, the power need base load for grids. And uh, that, that's being lost uh, because so much of the, uh, uh, you, you know, we see Europe itself going backward toward coal, uh, but the, the, much of the developing world is also going backward into dirtier fuels uh, and and losing access to electricity. So I think that's got to be one of the high focuses. Yeah, and just to go back to, again, food shortage as you know, a massive global problem, what can uh, private companies do to, to help kind of right that ship and alleviate that issue? What? I think it helps if people look ahead and say, okay, this will probably get worked out, and so therefore, there, you know, with prices higher, there's a profit to be made. Um, the, the, I, that's already been seen. We've seen the wheat prices come down. Other, other of the grain prices are coming down, and so I think that's good. I think the world can respond robustly with more supply if given a chance, and so that, that really is, you know, as we project out and say, I'm worried about a global recession, uh, I'd be less worried if I saw uh, more of the world saying we're going to redouble our efforts to produce both, well, and especially in the private sectors, of course. Um, just to close, I'd wanted to touch on um, sort of one case study if we look at uh, Africa. Um, obviously, a region that was deeply affected by the pandemic and the follow-on effects from the pandemic um, through the Tusk organization, I was made aware of a statistic that north of $20 billion of tourist revenue was lost as a result of the lockdowns, which then led to an explosion in poaching. So what tools does the World Bank have to combat issues like this that were sort of unprecedented? Um, yeah, and I'm, that's a very real problem. As governments struggle, then they make choices on spending, and it may not yeah. be the best choice, and then, and then uh, malfactors, uh, uh, poaching, for example, comes into play. Well, we, we, we try to help the governments in general, help uh, them assess the damage and think of policies, avoid subsidies, uh, or have, if to the extent that they're intervening, 
meaning have it be in least costly mechanisms for intervention. You know, that's a tough one because the advanced economies are often doing d giant non-targeted subsidies and interventions, but then lecturing the developing countries to be targeted. W one thing I'll mention is we did uh, a, a, an interesting innovative bond offering for black rhino bond, uh, um, bl black rhinos, um, so a type of rhinoceros that's, uh, that had dwindling numbers. And so we issued a bond, a World Bank bond that was a $150 million bond, uh, a five-year maturity, and the, instead of the coupon going to the, the investors uh, who probably don't need it, uh, the coupon goes to the uh, the conservation of and uh, uh, facilitation of of the black rhino stock uh, in in uh, in South Africa, and then a the uh, global environment facility will pay a premium to the bond uh, to the bond owners if the black rhino population goes up. So it's auditable, it's accountable, and and so you as an investor could could uh, feel good. Uh, your principal is assured, uh, and you you may actually get a, an incentive or a, a premium payment uh, if if it's a successful project. So we're trying to make that successful and also innovate in other areas in the same way. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for this. I know we went over, but this was wonderful to speak with you, President uh, David Malpass. Thank you. Good. Nice to see everyone. Thanks, Siri. Thank you. Thank you.